you're glad you're saved, say amen. 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 What a blessing, and uh, thank you so much for singing, Jeremiah, for, in the last minute of it, and um, being instant in season and out of season is a blessing. We still have people around. I uh, want to ask you for your prayer, if you would, um, a help for me personally. I ate some bad food today, and it's still messing with me. And so, um, but I'm glad, even in my weakness, um, I still have Christ, and and uh, He helps me through anything that we deal with. And so, um, I pray that you just pray for me as I try to get this truth across, because um, I believe it'll be a helpful one if we allow it to help us. And we hear sermons um, on a weekly basis. Those who this is the core crowd. And so, you've come Wednesday night, you come Sunday morning, you come Sunday night, and what a blessing that is! It's a big blessing. Um, but what a, more, what a bigger blessing it would be if we took it and we ran with it. And we would see a lot more joy in our life with application of Scripture and not just the hearing of it. And so if you would, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 this evening. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Is everybody glad the chairs are back? The way they Amen. I felt like the, uh, the, the presence of God might not have been here with some people. It's just like, we're just going to church, and we're here, but the chair's up the same way, so we'll try to make church happen, but it's, I don't know. But some people, they have a bigger smile on their face today than normal, so it's good to have you back. We're glad that you're here at Victory Baptist Church. Um, but we're very excited about this tonight, excited to preach. It's always an honor to preach God's Word, and He's worthy of it. He's worthy to, get, to be bragged on. He's worthy to... Um, to testify about, and so very excited about it tonight. Through 1 Corinthians, you know, as you know, but Eric has taught through this book, and as you know, it's a rebuke from Paul to a church. And he's talking to a church about some things that they need to straighten up, some things that they need to get right. And I heard a preacher say one time, he said, if Paul were alive today, the church would be getting a letter. And I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. There's a lot of craziness going on during this time, but imagine the craziness going on in this time. I mean, the First Corinthians is a very big book, and all of this is a rebuke on some things to get right in the church. And there's a lot of crazy stuff just happening in this chapter alone, First Corinthians chapter number 6. Number 1, you see in verses number 1 through 8, the brotherly conflicts. The brotherly conflicts. You have two Christians that are arguing about something that really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. You have Christians who are started off as in um, we're saints, we're, we're both been saved, but we disagree on something, and it's been a disagreement where it got to a point where it's like, I'm taking you to court over this disagreement. And so you, you get, to, to get to court and you're arguing over a small matter, and something that Paul says is, why in the world are you focusing so much on small matters when in reality, we're going to stand with God one day at the great white throne judgment, and we're going to judge angels, and we're going to judge the world. And he's saying, why in the world are you being so petty about small matters when one day you're going to stand and get to judge angels and the world, but yet we make such a big deal out of these small things? And so he's saying these brotherly conflicts, these are some things that you need to get right. And a lot of times we, we can argue about things that really don't matter. You know, I, I would may mention about the chairs. A lot of times we can allow some things to affect us the way they shouldn't. I remember whenever I was in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, very glad I'm in Texas now, praise the Lord. And uh, yeah, can I, we'll start a revival here in a second if I keep saying that. But I'm so happy to be here. But whenever I was there, I was witnessing for the bus route and I was visiting different kids and, and just inviting them to come to church. And as I'm visiting, I hear these two guys arguing and yelling and when I looked over there to see, it was probably from, I don't know, probably from, from this side of the wall all the way to the end of that, that wall. I was walking, and I looked, and I saw two guys arguing, and this one guy had a shotgun standing next to him, like in his, in his hand. And they're arguing, like, really loud. I'm like, okay, this is about to go down. I need to stay hidden. I ain't trying to get, you know, something doesn't happen. Well, they start arguing and start yelling even louder and louder. The one guy with the gun starts chasing the other guy and starts shooting at him. And I'm, we're watching all of this happen. Like, I'm just like, what in the world? Is like this, are they staging a movie? Like, what was going on? But the guy was chasing him and ended up shooting him. It was like attempted manslaughter. I was a witness for that. And all this stuff had happened. And the guy ended up getting up and running away. And we end up, the guy ended up being saved. He ended up living. But the crazy thing was, come to find out, they were arguing over $20. 
And the things that people argue about, and that's what Paul was saying is these brotherly conflicts, which then leads into a bad image. What, what's the bad image? Well, you're going in a court in front of unsaved people, and they're saying, wait a minute, you're a Christian, you go to the same church as so-and-so, but y'all can't get along? Ah, uh, If y'all can't get along, I mean, th there's nothing really that's really convincing about the whole Christian thing. If, if there's no peace in that, then that's not really something that I want. You're looking from the outside, looking in. It's a bad representation of Christ when we can't get along. And John chapter number 13 says, they will know you're my disciples by the way you love one another. And if I can stop right here for a second, that you know, people should know that you love them in the house of God. People should around should say, I, I feel that person is there for me. And, and a lot of times we can get in the mindset where you know, social media has made us unsocial. In the point where nobody talks to each other anymore. It's easy to come to church, sit in your corner, sit and do your thing. Don't really talk to anybody. Like, just avoid everybody. Leave. Go home. You go to your job. Go home. And you just don't talk to anybody. You don't socialize. But God makes the very big importance. I know it's easy to be in our comfort zone. But don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And the Bible also says provoking each other to good works. And it's kind of hard to do that when you just, it's us four and no more. We don't really add anybody in. We don't spend time with anybody. We don't encourage anybody. We just stay to ourselves. That people will see that, by the way, we love one another, which means we're and indicating that we're spending time with one another and trying to encourage one another. Brotherly conflicts, which then it leads to a bad Im image because we're not representing Christ right. But something else Paul talks about in this chapter, verses 13 through 18, he talks about bodily sins. He talks about fornication. And we don't have to dive deep into that, but I think everybody knows it's wrong to sleep around when you're not married. And it's wrong to sleep around on your spouse when you're married. So we've already established that. Paul discusses this, but Paul sums it up. Look with me in verse number 19. He sums up this whole chapter after we've talked about all this. And he says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your, what church? Body, and in your what? Which are God's. You know what God's saying? I want you to glorify me in your body, the things that people can see, and I want you to glorify me in your, my, your spirit, only, the things only that I can see. I want you to glorify me in both, and, and, and you know the result of being bought with a price is that we glorify God. That's the result of it. The fact that He has bought us, that He saved us, that's the result of being bought is glorifying God with our body and our spirit. In 2 Corinthians 6, in the first half of it, it talks about you've been saved. In the second half, it says you're now a son. There's a relationship now between the Father and the Son. And then in the, in the next chapter, 7 verse 1, it says, Therefore cleanse, because you've been saved, because you're a son, cleanse your body and your spirit. We should glorify God because of these things, because we've been bought with a price, because of everything Christ has did for us. And, and I just want to say tonight that I'm glad I'm saved, and I'm glad that I'm blood washed, and I'm glad His mercies are, are new every morning. I'm glad that He's long-suffering and that His blood has washed away all my sins. And, and whenever we mess up and we go back to Christ and we ask forgiveness, He said, I don't know what sin you're talking about. And His forgiveness is always there, and He's always been there for us. What a big blessing it is, and I, I don't know if people have gotten over your salvation, but if you don't get anything else tonight, I'm just glad that I'm saved tonight, and that Jesus Christ has washed away all my sins, and, and he's, he's ever with me. The Bible says He will never leave thee nor forsake thee, and it's a blessing to know that He is always with you. That's encouraging. I've said it many times before, it's easy to get in conflicts with people where you leave a friendship because of the way that you act, but God says, I will never leave thee, I will never forsake thee. And that's a promise that's not dependent on what you do, it's dependent on who He is, which is a, which is a huge blessing that He's always there, He's always, always there for us. So the question I would ask you is, are you worth the price of the investment? If you've been bought with a price, shouldn't, isn't there an expectation or assumption that something is supposed to do its job on that end? Illustration. If I bought this chair right here, 
what is is it a correct is it a right assumption that this chair is going to hold me up when I sit down on it? Is that a right assumption? Everybody with me? If I pay for this chair with the purpose of it doing a specific job and then I sit down in it and the legs break out, which I mean that could be for other reasons too, but we're not going to talk about that. But if the if the legs go out from under it, do I have a right to be upset? Because I literally bought this with a specific purpose, a specific plan, and it did not do its job. You know what the Bible says? That we, we've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit because they're God's. Revelation chapter number 4 and verse number 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. He has the right to be glorified in every single thing that we do. The things that people can see and the things that only God could see. We should live a life that's sanctified and separated for Christ's glory for everything that He's did for us. Amen. If you would just dwell on what Christ did for you on Calvary, I don't, I don't know how your wood's wet if you can't get excited about that. Can get excited about as good as I know we can come into church sometimes and, and we feel low, we feel tired, we feel uh, sometimes maybe even moody, but that does not uh, get rid of the fact that He is worthy of our praise and He is worthy of the glory that we can give Him in, in our life because He has done everything and He deserves the praise and He deserves the glory. He's worthy of it every single day. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We should seek to glorify him wholly with the time that we have left. I'm not going to preach long tonight, but if you would, turn with me to Joshua chapter number 14. Joshua chapter number 14. So would you agree with me that he's worthy? Would you, are you, can you say tonight that you're thankful that he saved you from a devil's hell and you get to go to heaven? Is he worthy of it? Well, then we should be not only great examples of living a bought life to the people that are around us. We should be a great testimony, but we should also in our private lives glorify God. It's easy to, to come in front of people and dress nice. And when you walk in, people are like, man, he must be right with God. But that doesn't mean anything. Joshua chapter number 14, as you know, Caleb and Joshua, I've always wanted to preach a sermon entitled Having a CJ Mentality, Caleb and Joshua, because they send 12 spies out to, to view the promised land, and God says, hey, we're going to overtake it, but y'all go look at it, and so they go, 10 spies come back and say, there's no way we can do this. We're as grasshoppers, grasshoppers in their sight, they're as giants, they're, there's no way that we can uh, accompany this feat and be able to win this war. But Caleb and Joshua come back and say, hey, we got this. Like, let's go ahead and get the, the weapons ready. Let's go ahead and fight this battle. God said we're going to win it, so we're going to win it. And they come back in that way, and God loved that. God, God was so excited that they came back and had faith enough that if God said they were going to win it, they were going to win it. He loved that spirit about them. And one of those people, Caleb, uh, we're going to get to that, that scripture specifically. But after this, this whole thing happened, Caleb literally makes a statement about himself in verse number 8. He says, I wholly followed the Lord. Look with me in verse number 8, Joshua 14, 8. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly follow the Lord my God. Caleb said about himself, I, I can examine myself, I can look at the life that I've lived, and I can tell you right now, I have wholly followed the Lord. I wonder if you can examine your heart and say, have, do I wholly follow the Lord? Do I fully glorify Him with my life in the way that I live? Caleb says it, but number two, Moses says it. Look at verse number nine. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. Caleb says it about himself. He says, I've wholly followed the Lord. And it's one thing to say it about yourself because a lot of times we can justify things. It's one thing to say it about yourself, but I wonder, can your leaders say it about you? Can, if we were to get to the pastor, pastor Knight here and you were to ask him, hey, through my actions, through what you see on the outside, does it look like I wholly follow the Lord from what you've experienced? 
Can you ask him that? Can we get your boss here on a Sunday and say, hey, can we, can we talk to you? Can we interview you for a second? How does so-and-so live at their job? Do they, do they witness to people? Do they listen to the right music? Do they do all these things? Can your leaders in your life say, they wholly follow the Lord? I watch them. They wholly, he, they wholly follow the Lord. Can you say it about yourself? The second thing is, can your leaders say it about you? But third, I want you to notice with me in verse number 13 and 14, can your friends say it about you? Verse number 13, and Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh. I think that's the way you say that. We'll, we'll just go with that. Hebron for an inheritance. Um, Hebron therefore became the uh, inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Caleb says it about himself. His leader says he wholly followed the Lord, but his friends said it as well. Caleb and Joshua were friends. There's some people that, that you let into your life. You may not let us into your life. You may not let people in the church into your life. But there's some friends in your life. And if we could interview them, we bumped into you one day and you were with friends we've never met. Could we interview them and say, hey, do they wholly follow the Lord with their life? So, ah, I don't know. I've been with them. I, I didn't even know he went to church. Can your friends say that about you? Can you say that about yourself? Can your leaders in your life say that about you if we were to ask them? But can your friends say it? All three are true so far. But, but lastly, look, at, look with me numbers. Go back to your left. Numbers 14. Numbers 14. Numbers chapter number 14, verse number 24. Say amen when you get there. Amen. Still hear some pages turning. That's a, that's a good sign. That's a blessing. Numbers 14 and verse number 24 not only do they say it, but I want you to notice God says it. Numbers 14, 24, But my servant Caleb, because he had had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Caleb said it about himself. I, I have wholly followed the Lord. His leaders said it about him. Could we ask your leaders... His friends said it, but God said it about him. You know what God says specifically in that verse that nobody else said? He had another spirit in him. You see, all the friends, all of the, the leaders, they're looking from the outside, looking in. And they said, he wholly followed the Lord. But there's a God in heaven that looked at the spirit and said, he wholly follows me. There's a part of your life where you're living on outwardly and we might look at your life and you might have everybody full, but there's a God in heaven that sees your heart and can say, he follows me fully. I wonder if you can look on both fronts, whether in your private life and your public life and say, he wholly follows the Lord. I'm not talking about trying to follow the Lord. I, I, I know we're all trying. We all make mistakes, but like actually giving forth an effort, like I want to glorify God with my life. Can we ask, can you ask yourself tonight, as we end this service tonight, can you look at yourself and say, I wholly follow the Lord? Can your leaders say it? If we were to interview them, can your friends say it? Could God say it? Because we don't go home with you. We don't watch the, we don't watch the TV that you watch when you get home from church. We don't listen to the music. We don't know the music you listen to when you get home from church. But God does. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So we see the public. I'm seeing you right now, and man, I'm like, man, these, there's a lot of the people that I know here that, man, they're an encouragement. They live for God, but I don't see you when you go home. There's some actions you see. What, what are some things that people see? Well, people might see anger outwardly and some things. And you might look at people that have maybe a temper problem and anger, and you say, man, they're, maybe they're not right with God in that moment. But there's some people that have matured past that. To give you an example, I played basketball a lot just growing up. And I used to have a big temper. I'm extremely competitive. I know Brian can say amen to this. I'm, you know, extremely competitive, but I've worked on it. Um, but there's still some other people in my life that are still extremely competitive and have a temper problem. But that person will remain unnamed. We won't talk about that. But... I used to be, I'm talking about argue all the time. I, I just hate to lose. I don't know if there's any other competitive people in here. I just hate to lose. And so I would always argue, that was a foul, that was this, all that. And I was just always had a temper. Well, there got to a point where I matured that, where I didn't do it outwardly anymore. 
But on the inside, I was extremely critical. Extremely critical. You might look and say, man, my chaos really improved. And we should seek to improve our outside to be a better testimony for people. But I still had a critical spirit on, my, on the inside. And there's a lot of people, we've never seen you lose your temper. We've never seen you get really mad. But when you come into church, you have a very critical spirit. You're critical of yourself. You're critical of people around you. You're critical of the service. You're critical of different things. And none of us see it. None of us know it. But God does. We should have, it's both sides. We should work on being a right testimony and example in front of people, but also in private when we're alone with God, we should still have the same testimony. God sees the Spirit. You know what other people see? People see adultery. When we do adultery, that's a known thing out in public. But you know what the Bible also says? You've never committed adultery publicly that we know of, but you know what God says? If you lust in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. So you have a part that people see, then you have a part that only God sees. But it's still, the, still sin. Still the same thing. But it's hidden. That's a, that's a blessing. It's hidden, so nobody knows, but God knows. You see, people see your actions, but God sees your attitude. Turn with me to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. I, I don't have much longer left. Matthew chapter number 23. I'm not going to tell you that I only have one verse left. I did that one time, and people have been on me ever since. Say amen, Brother James. He's like, yeah, just one more verse, brother, just one more verse. But I'm not, So I'm not going to do that, but I am not going to be much longer, I promise you. Matthew chapter 23. So there is there's people that you might look out on the outside and say, man, they must be right with God, but they could be far from God. God's like, I ain't talked to them in months. I don't, I don't even remember the last time I talked to them. But then there's also people, and I'm going to mention this in a second, the references, but there's also people that are living right that are improperly judged by man as well. But, but Matthew chapter number 23, look with me in verse number 23. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and, and anise and come in and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment and mercy and faith these ought you have done and not to leave the other undone so they have the outward done they show up they tithe but they lived out mercy and faith in these different things look with me in verse number 27 woe unto you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you are like unto whited sepulchers which indeed appear beautiful outward but are within full of dead man's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous unto man, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. People can look from the outside and say, man, that person, they must be living for God. But God says, I don't, I don't see nothing there. Amos 5.23, they're, they're, they're doing music, they're singing unto the Lord, but God says, I just hear a bunch of noise because their heart wasn't in the right place. You know, we could see you tithe and say, man, they're giving to the church. What a blessing. But God says he loves a cheerful giver. It's the motive of it. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bible doesn't say he's going to judge you for the size of something. He says he's going to judge you for the sort of it. God's judging you for the motives of why you do something. And he's the one that sees it. He's the one that sees the spirit. People just see the outward. But there's some people that can look on the outside and make assumptions. And I, and I know we should never make assumptions. We should... We should only look at actions and judge by that. But a lot of people make assumptions for oh, why you're living for God or, 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 or what's going on. For instance, you have David and Michael. Michael, David literally comes back. The ark of the Lord has come back and he's dancing before the Lord. And Michael says, oh, he's just doing it to get attention. And she's being critical in her heart towards David. And David said, literally, God's watching me. I'm doing this for God. I'm doing this for the right motive. And she ends up being harshly judged for that because of that false judgment towards him. You have Eliab and David. If you remember 1 Samuel 17, uh, David goes to the fight, and he's looking, all these guys are standing around. Nobody's fighting Goliath. And God, David starts talking to them, and his older brother, Eliab, and I know it's harsh for, for older brothers to look at younger brothers and like, what do you think you're even doing anyway? And just like, you just want to smack them. I totally understand it. Like, I get Eliab's position. But he looks at David, and, and David's trying to be courageous. He's like, man, why aren't we doing something? And he looks and he says, I know your naughtiness of heart, David, of the few sheep that you get. And he starts going this whole verse talking about the, the motives and the, the thoughts that David in secret has, when in reality that's not the truth. He was making an assumption about David and saying these things. 
You can improperly judge people from the outside. Think about Job. I mean, what, what about Job? You know, oh, what sins have you done, Job, that God would bring this judgment on you? He didn't do anything. But man looking on the outside improperly judged Job. But he was there right with God. They were right with God. And so tonight, you can look on the, the outside and see different things. And you know what we should do either way is we should glorify God in front of people to be a testimony and to be an example for people to look at your life. People shouldn't say when you ask them about, it, oh, yeah, he goes to the bar all the time. He drinks. He, he, he cusses all the time. He's at this party. He's at, he's at over here in this club and that club and what, doing this, that, and the other. That shouldn't be your testimony. You should be able to ask, like, man, he's, an, he's a huge encouragement. His testimony is a blessing. He lives for God. Every time I see him, he's living for God. But then also God from heaven should be able to look down and say, he has wholly followed me. She has wholly followed me with their life. And I see it. Nobody else sees it, but I see the, the, the private thing. You know, you see that God sees the evil that's done in private, but God sees just as much as that. He sees the good that's done in private as well. And that should be encouraging to you. That those of you who serve God and we don't see what you do privately, you should get excited because God is keeping record and there's coming a day he's going to reward you for that. And so that should be exciting to you. But we should seek to please God both on the outside, what people can see, and also the inside as well. And you say, Mike, I may have messed up. I've, I have a bad reputation from the way that I've lived because people have seen my life. They've seen my actions. I've made a bad mistake. Well, there's hope for you. There's hope for you to start living right. Paul was a murderer, but then ended up becoming one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. Moses was a murderer but, and, and killed that Egyptian, but came back and led all of them out of Egypt. David was an adulterer, but ended up being able to write Psalm 51 and saying, I taught transgressors not to go down that way. If you, if you have made a mistake, there is still hope for you that you can start. There's mercies new every morning, and you can get up every single day excited that, man, this is a new day. I've made a mistake. I've, I've gone down the path that I shouldn't have gone down, but God has given me new mercy. I, I get to serve him. What a blessing that is. To glorify God outwardly where people can see it, that reputation, but also saying, God, nobody's around me right now, but I'm not going to watch that because I know I shouldn't, shouldn't watch that. I'm not going to listen to that because I know it's not glorifying to God. And you know what the Bible says? He says, whatsoever you, if you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. He makes the emphasis of whether you're just eating and drinking, something we do so often, do everything to the glory of God in your life. Do everything. Psalms 1914, this is the, the last verse, I promise. Last verse, Psalm 1914, I can say it this time. Let the words of my mouth, you know this verse, so this is what people can see, people can hear it. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. We need to get the outward part right. Where people, if people could, we could interview people, they, they could say, yeah, I know them, they live for God, I, I see it. But also for God to look at you and say, man, they live for God. He, he, has, the, he has another spirit in them, and when nobody else sees, I see it, I'm keeping a record of it, and one day I'm going to reward them for what they're doing. We can stand as Brother, Brother Brett's coming. I wonder if, if you can say maybe in your heart, Have you glorified God outwardly where people can say, man, they serve God and they're a huge encouragement by the way they live. But I wonder if there's, if you, there's things you do privately that only God can see. I wonder if that's glorifying to him. The things we watch, the things we listen to, the things that nobody else sees. But that's the most important thing. You said only, you know, you hear this response all the time. Only God can judge me. You realize how much worse that is? We say, don't judge me, only God can judge me. Well, he's going to. And we should make sure that we have that relationship right. And you can go ahead and start playing, Miss Dan. But we need to make sure we have both of those right. Because Jesus Christ, he said, preserve it, be blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that's the next thing happening on God's calendar? And it could happen literally right after this service. Why not get some things right?
There might be some things that you need to get forgiveness for, and Christ could come back literally right after the service, and those are things you're going to have to answer for because you didn't ask forgiveness for them. Hey, he's faithful and just to forgive us. If you made a mistake, tomorrow's a new day. You can start over. And God is more than excited to do that. And he forgives and he forgives that, forgets and forgives that sin. We should seek to glorify him in both parts. Outwardly, what people can see, serving God being a testimony, but also what God sees that we don't see. We should seek to glorify him in that as well.